any any sort of price movement has multiple reasons. I mean, at the end of the day, there's more buyers than sellers. Um, so what we can do is we can kind of determine where that buying is coming from. It's not coming from ETFs, for example, in the Western world. Um, you know, the, their tonnage is actually down from all time highs, uh, and it's just it's not doing very good on that front. Uh, instead, a lot of the buying is coming from foreign central banks, as well as from foreign private sector, uh, notably in Asia. Uh, that's where the bulk of the buying is. And then, at least in the West, you don't seem to have a lot of selling. Uh, re retail numbers are, are improving in the U.S. So, for example, with Costco introducing gold, um, there are more access points for it. So, you know, some of the bull bullion dealer numbers seem to be decent. Um, so it is it is fairly broad, but it is it is more sovereign and more Eastern um, focused. Um, and I guess one of the things that's remarkable about it is that it, the, the price is doing pretty well, despite the fact that um, nominal interest rates and even real interest rates are fairly high, which is normally a pretty significant headwind. And also the dollar index is, is strong. And so the fact that gold is doing this well despite headwinds, uh, I think has a lot of information in it. Despite high nominal interest rates and a strong dollar, gold is performing remarkably well. Recent data reveals that foreign central banks, especially in Asia, are the primary buyers, while Western ETF holdings are on the decline. For instance, US retail numbers are improving, with Costco introducing gold, providing more access points for consumers. This shift indicates a strategic move by central banks, with gold holdings rising since 2009. Interestingly, since 2014, foreign central banks have also reduced their accumulation of US treasuries, influenced by a strong dollar and strategic diversification. This trend highlights a significant shift towards a multipolar world economy, where diversifying reserves, including gold, offers security against potential geopolitical risks and financial uncertainties. As gold becomes a key asset, its performance in the face of traditional economic headwinds carries valuable information for investors and policymakers alike. So they, they have an amount that's like 30 some thousand tons, um, all, all central banks combined. And the history of that is that you know during the 80s, 90s, um, 2000s, that overall tonnage was generally on a gradual decline uh, in the world. And it bottomed in 2009 uh, and then started gradually going back up from there. Uh, it, it's kind of the history of central bank gold holdings in absolute tonnage. Um, we're also seeing that um, uh, back around 2013, 2014 is about a decade ago now. Um, foreign central banks in aggregate kind of stopped loading up on U.S. treasuries. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. Generally speaking, whenever the dollar index is strong, uh, somewhat intuitively, um, central banks are not really buying treasuries uh, much when the dollar index is strong. And that happened around 2014. And so, uh, you know, we've, we've kind of been in this like stronger dollar environment uh, to varying degrees since then. And um, there's been less treasury buying in largely because of it. There's a couple different reasons. One is that about a decade ago, China announced that accumulating treasuries is no longer in their interest. And so we've seen a shift from them toward a diversifying of their portfolio strategy and, and including more illiquid investments, things like, you know, lending to other markets uh, for commodity deposits and, and or, or um, infrastructure, basically the Belt and Road Initiative type of uh, activities. That's kind of been one of the areas. Um, as well as increasing their gold holdings. Um, and so there's been some strategic aspect to it, but there's also just the strong dollar aspect, which is that whenever the dollar is in one of its big weakening cycles, like it was in the 70s or like it was in the um, late 80s or like it was in the 2000s, um, generally, you know, other currencies are therefore doing pretty good. And uh, sometimes they even want to weaken their currency a little bit. And one thing they can do is increase their reserves. They can create more of their currency and buy foreign assets. It could be treasuries, could be gold, whatever. Um, so generally, they, t they tend to accumulate assets, including treasuries, on a weaker dollar trend. Uh, but when the dollar is strengthening or it's kind of holding at a strong level, they're generally more in currency defense mode. And so they're usually not increasing their reserves by very much. Now, that's, that's as a group. You could still have individual countries that are acting out of out of you know the average but as a group you know their their debts their like dollar debts are generally harder because the dollar is stronger now their currencies are a little bit under pressure 
Um, and so they're, if anything, they might be selling some reserves to buy back their own currency, but at the very least, they're often just not really accumulating reserves uh, aggressively when they're trying to keep their currency um, propped up to a significant degree. That's the environment we've been in. Um, and so, but around the margins, they are um, pointing more toward gold than treasuries over the past 10 years or so. And I think there's a number of reasons for it. I mean, basically, um, you know, during the entire kind of post GFC decade, treasury, you know, short-term rates were held at near zero. Um, you also had um, you know, this increasing kind of, I would argue, a multipolar tendency in the world. So any sort of U.S. security, treasury security, stock security, corporate bond security, whatever the case may be, those are freezable assets. Um, they can be unilaterally frozen by the U.S. government. And so there's a number of entities that are either frenemies or competitors or uh just for their own even if they don't see like as a high possibility that their reserves be frozen they say look i mean we you know we might be pressured at some time in the future we don't know who's going to be president for election cycles from now so let's diversify into a little bit of other currencies let's diversify into gold um these are kind of the options that they have available to them and i think those are some of the trends that we're seeing uh in that kind of central bank room it's over 10%. I don't have the numbers in front of me. Uh, and it depends on the central bank. I mean, Russia, for example, even before their reserve freezing, they had a very high percentage of gold. Um, Canada's like, got, I think they, they have like no gold anymore. Um, uh, a lot of the European ones are fairly high. You know, Italy, Germany, they have a fairly high gold percentage. Um, the United States, because they're the axiom of the current system, they have very minimal foreign currency reserves, um, but their gold holdings are still substantial. Um, and so in aggregate, I believe it's low double digit percentage, uh, which makes it one of the larger reserve holdings, um, but still notably smaller than their collective treasury holdings. Yeah, I'm referring to foreign exchange reserves. Uh, that's different than bank reserves. Um, so yeah, it's good to bring up that distinction. Bank reserves in any given country are part of their base money, along with currency and circulation. That's a direct liability of their central bank. Um, whereas foreign exchange reserves is you know, a country is operating, you know, at basically there's 160 currencies in the world. And you can kind of think of them like arcade tokens where they're all these kind of, you know, some of them are pegged, some of them are free floating. Um, and when more capital is kind of flowing into that currency, uh, it's generally strengthening. And when more capital is leaving that currency, it, it's generally weakening. Uh, and that's also partially dependent on the supply and demand of that currency, right? If, if Argentina's currency is expanding at a very rapid rate, not a lot of people want it. And also the supply keeps increasing, so that's going to keep deteriorating, uh, diluting against other currencies, for example. I think that's a fairly extreme case. But in a more marginal case, um, you know, generally speaking, or, you know, if, if a currency is weakening too much, they want to be able to have something that they can sell and then buy back some of their own currency with. Basically, all these currencies are being bought and sold. Um, many of them, so uh, something like 90% of, of FX transactions, and FX is a massive market, Something like 90% of them have the dollar on one side of the transaction. Um, and so it's, there's not a lot of um, volume between different currency pairs. They're mostly like if you want to go from one currency to another currency, it's often your currency to the dollar and then the dollar to that other currency. Um, that is changing a little bit because, you know, say China and Russia are doing more direct, um, you know, swaps now and things like that. But in general, that's still the case globally. And so... Um, a lot of, you know, and also, for example, most oil, most international contracts are denominated in dollars. Uh, most um, global capital, like if, if, a, if a company in, if an investment company in Germany lends to a corporation in Brazil, for example, even though the dollar is neither of their currencies, that's likely going to be in dollars. Um, the euro is the second biggest, but it's a distant second. So the dollar is by far the biggest um, uh, currency used for international lending. So denomination of in international contracts, denomination of international lending, uh, and most for you know, oil sales, that'd be part of international contracts. And so the purpose of having reserves is, is a fewfold. One is that they can defend their own currency. Um, they, can, they, can, they can sell some of their reserves to buy back some of their own currency. Or inversely, if they want to weaken their currency, they can create more currency and use it to accumulate reserves. Um, that, that's one tool. A second one is that if they have various entities in their country, for example, corporations or banks that are doing dollar financing in one way, they might have dollar debt. This is particularly true for emerging markets. 
um, uh, they uh, the, the central bank wants an option to be able to bail those out if they have a crisis. So they want to be able to lend dollars to those corporations um, so that they don't just nominally default every time there's a recession. Um, and and so they, they kind of maintain stockpiles of that. And of course, central bank uh, um, uh, swaps, uh, swap lines can increase that flexibility, but they don't want to have to rely on those necessarily because they might not be given them by the Federal Reserve. And so they often hold a number of, of quote unquote kind of hard monies um, and the dollar is considered hard just because, for example, if Brazil's holding dollars, they can't print dollars. From, from their perspective, that's a hard asset. Uh, and from the international perspective, even though it is diluting over time. Um, but because that's what, you know, a lot of their contracts are denominated, their debt denominated in, that's a big tool for them. And gold is something that is, you know, over time it holds up well versus dollars and treasuries, but it can have a decade where it, you know, underperforms. And then also it is volatile compared to the unit of account of those liabilities and those international contracts. And so from, from that perspective, it's maybe a little bit less useful as a reserve asset in this existing kind of international system. Um, but it still works as a significant percentage because, you know, the volatility is not huge. And on average, the, over time, the, the value holds up well compared to dollars. Thanks for watching today's video. Let's recap the key points from our discussion on gold and its impact on the global economy. We explored how, despite high interest rates and a strong dollar, gold is performing exceptionally well. This is largely driven by foreign central banks, especially in Asia, while Western ETF holdings are declining. We also discussed how US retail numbers are improving, with more access points for gold, like Costco. Additionally, we highlighted the strategic shift by central banks away from US treasuries towards gold. Influenced by the stronger dollar and geopolitical considerations, these trends suggest a significant shift towards a multipolar world economy, emphasizing the importance of diversifying reserves to include gold. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and share your thoughts in the comments section below.